like to call the May 1st, 2017 David County Commissioners meeting to order. At this time, if you would join me in the invocation. Dear God, as we come before you this evening, as always, we are grateful for the freedom we have. We are always thankful of that. We are reminded daily that freedom is not free. We are appreciative of the right for self-governance. We are thankful for all the people that are in attendance this evening. And as we go through this meeting tonight, we ask for your wisdom and guidance. In your name, amen. amen. You will stand, me, stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Appreciate you coming out on this evening of inclement weather here. Um, at this time, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor, raise your hand. Okay. Next, we move to the public comment period. Uh, Mr. Vogel, I understand no one has signed up this evening. That is correct. Next, we have, as everyone knows, we've been talking about the recreation plan for Davie County. And tonight, uh, Mr. Paul Moore is going to give us an update on that. So, Paul, we'd ask you to come forward. Mr. Chairman, before uh, Mr. Moore gets started, I just want to uh, thank him for the amount of work he's put into this project and also uh, recognize uh, Dr. Hartness in, in the crowd tonight. Uh, as it relates to uh, the high school repurposing project and uh, our partnership there. So I know that we have uh, to date uh, already had discussions about uh, the phased approach to the project and um, how this is going to occur. And I, I could say as of right now, uh, our current high school project is on budget uh, and also on time. And so we're, we're pleased about that and as we uh, have a discussion with uh, the schools about uh, the transition and how things are going to occur. Uh, we feel uh, good about where we are with things. So, Dr. Hartness, thank you for uh, your partnership and for uh, working with us. So. Okay, our PowerPoint's not loaded up. Okay, can we pull up the? Um, you can go ahead. Can you give your presentation? Yeah, I can. Because okay. they have it in the packet, okay. and I can do it. Okay, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, this evening I'm going to share with you some highlights uh, of our department uh, that have occurred since our transition and inaugural birth of David County Recreation and Parks since July 2016. Uh, in addition, I'm going to share with you an update on the repurposing project. To begin with, uh, I want to highlight three goals that are inscribed in our 2013 Comprehensive Park and Recreation Master Plan. Uh, that are front and center that, that it relates to our transition. The first goal is to create buy-in to the concept that recreation and parks is important in Davie County. Uh, the second is to create a new branding initiative for Davie County Recreation and Parks that promotes public awareness and creates excitement for recreation and parks in the county. And thirdly, to begin the conversion of the existing high school property into a multifunction park. This is a, an essential element to, uh, an essential element to the first two goals uh, is our mission and vision, uh, which ultimately illustrates who we are and what we do as a department. So uh, something that we, we illustrate all the time is our mission to enrich the quality of life in Davie County by offering exceptional recreation services uh, through a diverse system of parks, uh, programs, events, and cultural resources. And of course our vision uh, is to, is that Davie County Recreation Parks is a vibrant, innovative, viable department committed to providing excellent recreation service delivery, enriching active movement, and achieving high quality of life for current and future generations. Our tagline, which we developed, is, is inscribed as TEAM, which stands for Together Enriching Active Movement. That is what the foundation and the basis of what most parks and recreation departments do, uh, but specifically for our team to uh, enrich that active movement. So our team members, I uh, want to tell you a little bit about our team. Uh, Amanda Aker, who is our Athletics Program Director. 
she coordinates our countywide athletic program as well as social media and website. Scott Lugwitt, who is our administrative events coordinator, uh, coordinates and facilitates all of our special events as well as, uh, as, well as administrative logistics. Renee Gallagher, who is our part-time recreation specialist, specialist uh, focuses on technical support assistant, assistance programs and event organization. So what has our team accomplished in the 10 months since uh, our, our transition started? So we've adopted our code of ordinances. We've established a 14-member Recreation and Park Advisory Board, uh, completed renovations to the Brock, uh, developed three program guides. We've offered 35 programs and events to our community. Uh, active Network, we've uh, adopted and initiated uh, and implemented Active Network, which is our online registration portal. Uh, we've, uh, we've uploaded and, and created our Facebook page as well as our webpage through the DavieCountyNC.gov website. Uh, it's fully functional, it's relevant, and up to date every week. Uh, just a point of notes, we already have 923 likes, 924 as of today, 937 followers just on our Facebook, So, and we have an average of a 600 to 700 weekly reach of our posts. Uh, so that is uh, quite incredible uh, that people are taking an active involvement and in, in understanding what we are doing as a department. Um, we've received uh, over a little over $7,000 in financial do donations and sponsorships. Uh, we've received over 6,600 uh, benefactor. These are in-kind uh, donations through our events through three events. One point that I truly want to emphasize on is the number of volunteers that you see in your packet. 204 volunteers in a 10 month period. Uh, that includes event volunteers, athletic coaches, assistant coaches, scorekeepers, line judges, as well as independent instructors. Uh, that, uh, that amount reaches over 2,472 volunteer hours. That is incredible. Uh, volunteers uh, create a big portion of, of what park and recreation agencies do uh, year in and year out, so we can't thank them enough. Uh, to finish out the transition, I uh, want, to, want to move into the repurposing project. Uh, as you know, we've awarded uh, the design consultant contract that's led by the John R. McAdams Company, uh, followed by the excellent subconsultant teams of Clearscapes, Pros Consulting, and ETC Institute. We've completed four public input meetings, uh, two park design workshops, and random uh, and non-random surveys. Needs assessment is being finalized as well as we're entering into our conceptual master plan design phase. So naturally, uh, with such a buzz and excitement with, the, with this repurposing project, uh, with the development of a new park, in addition to the park being developed on a historical site and hallowed ground to those who once roamed Davy High School <coughs> since 1956. Also, another natural effect of this project come misconceptions and the rumor mill along the way. So we want to, uh, we've put together uh, in an effort to be transparent and to help you and our residents to better understand the project as we continue to move forward, we put together uh, an FAQ. So uh, to start that process, one question that's being asked is what is being demolished by the Davie County School System? Uh, on your chart you'll see uh, a map uh, and those buildings that are highlighted indicated by bar stripes are buildings C, D, E, F, G, and H. Uh, and J. And again, those are indicated by the bar stripes uh, on this presentation. That is what is being currently demoed or will be demoed by the Davie County um, school system. Is the $5 million recreation bond used to fund the demo? The answer is no. The Davie County school system is funding the demo and flat grading the area. Okay. Uh, is the $5 million recreation bond 
Again, used to fund the demo, know that the school system's doing that. What buildings and facilities will remain after the demo? Uh, that will be buildings A, B, K, L, the cafeteria, parking lots, and football field. Are there any other buildings under demo consideration? Discussions have occurred regarding the building B, uh, but careful consideration uh, and a cost-benefit analysis will be completed uh, to ascertain uh, what the programming needs are, the renovation cost, the deferred maintenance cost, operational cost, and cost of demo and abatement to determine the feasibility of removal. So that consideration of the B building uh, is one that we will look at. If it is determined that we should remove uh, building B, what will the cost, would the cost of the demo come from the recreation bond? The answer is yes. Next, I wanna lead you Next, I want to lead you into. Oh, can uh, I ask you a quick question? Yes, sir. Why? What? Uh, what discussion? I mean, what? What is the? Uh, what's the purpose of demoing B there in the middle of that? Currently, right now, what? Or the, what would be the thoughts behind? The that? thoughts behind that, or what purposes? What's behind uh, the programming elements that could be used for? What are the deferred maintenance costs that could be a potential? Uh, how does it create that open space into the park? So those are some of the thoughts behind that. When we look at the conceptual uh, designs back in 2013, two of the three concepts had B building removed. So there was discussion even at that time. They had pools in there. Yeah. In, in that it, one was a pool. One was a one was at a, a basketball outdoor basketball court. And I think, Commissioner Jones, that's why, uh, as Mr. Moore talked about, you know, we really have to do a, a benefit analysis of uh, what's going to happen in that building based on what the programming needs are and uh, what the age of the building is and um, uh, versus the upkeep and all those things. And I think it's premature at this point to do that. So that's something the Recreation and Parks Advisory Board will be considering to make a recommendation back to this body. That's correct. That's correct. Now what you see here, the next slide is a, the, one of the 2013 concepts, uh, conceptual drawings that were initially created to show residents, uh, resident ideas of what the park project would look like. So what we want to talk to you about today is the difference between a conceptual plan versus a master plan. A conceptual plan is really a depiction of proposed ideas uh, that you wish to incorporate on a park site by identifying those various opportunities and features, uh, beliefs, and ideological opinions. It's one that can change over various reasons. That could be of time, factual data, strategic planning modifications, economic impacts, as well as cost estimates and consistency between the comprehensive master plan and park master plan. Uh, again, it is a plan that can undergo many changes before coming a master plan. So what are we doing now? What we are doing now is transferring a conceptual plan into a master plan. And a master plan, and a master plan details the location and characteristics of the proposed park site. It's detailed. It serves as a business plan for modifications, economic considerations, financial ports to refine the overall project. It also includes phases to the project, scale models, and needed developmental aspects. And it is also executed until the end of the project. So just a little bit of difference between the two. Again, the conceptual, di design, conceptual designs plans can always change until you get over to the master plans, which are more detailed and will service, uh, service uh, to the end of the project. Again, based on uh, your individual uh, interviews with McAdams, uh, the uh, Board of Commissioners, you've all collectively agreed that you want to rely on resident input stemming from the public input sessions, design workshops, surveys, and needs assessment as we consider what the final plan design will ultimately look like. So, uh, what factual data have we uncovered thus far? So, based upon uh, four public input sessions, two design workshops. Here are some of the reoccurring themes, uh, which you can read through here. 
Uh, focus on non-sport recreation as indoor activities, outdoor community spaces, shelter facilities, civic parks, amphitheaters for events, movies in the park, concerts, playgrounds, splash pads, swimming and court games for all ages. Fitness uh, is important but needs to be unique uh, since we don't want to duplicate services. Uh, provide food offerings. That's one of the things that, uh, to, that come up uh, throughout our meetings is uh, what kind of opportunities are there. Uh, concerns about limited space and the budget for the project and the desire to balance both aspects. Uh, preserving the history and redesign to reflect the importance of the high school site and its place in the community. Uh, looking for unique sport opp opportunities. So the Little League football was mentioned quite a few times. Uh, accommodating indoor and outdoor travel leagues uh, to utilize gym and outdoor field space. Uh, master plan should be done in phases while remaining within budget. Uh, should be a core offering of passive activities uh, that are free while others should have fees for specialized events and facilities. Revenue opportunities and operational fees for active uh, pay to play should be as help to uh, sustain the park. Um, another one to note, we, uh, what kind of economic development and traffic flow are we going to have? in amongst the 35 acres which we have, uh, which we're restricted by the location of the elements that will remain. So what can we actually fit in there? Uh, remaining spaces behind the buildings cause concerns. Example, baseball fields 200 feet or less uh, was a concern that was brought up a number of times. Potential for outdoor training facility uh, to support a variety of sports on a multi-purpose field. Since this is a sports-oriented uh, county, and there's a lot of folks to do that, a lot of these training facilities are, are popping up, and they're quite a resource uh, um, for young, uh, as young teens as well as young adults as well. Um, Community-related activities, such as an amphitheater. Uh, again, we're focusing a focus on gym space, fitness area, classroom spaces. Um, and uh, ex within the existing building spaces. So, design workshop priority results. Um, during this, this phase, we've uh, received collected input and provided a response to the residents that attended uh, potential activities and allowed for a vote on a variety of indoor-outdoor activities. The results from this meeting produce the following priorities as voted on by the participants. And you can see the indoor activities as well as outdoor activities. And a third category, which is what we call niche or niche activities. And what those are are, are non-traditional type of, of activities and or facilities that could be incorporated uh, into a park system. Again, those are just based off of the design workshops. And approximately how many people attended those? Uh, the attendance of the public input meetings and workshops was around 60 folks. As an integral and essential element to the planning process, uh, it also must involve factual survey data, uh, which, to which resident voters weigh in ideas and features that they believe are needed for the park, uh, what they would most likely use in the park, and for what cost they would be willing to pay. We had a, uh, the national average for statewide and nationally park projects is usually 8 to 10%. Uh, anytime you get into double digits, that's a great sampling. We were at 22.8%. Uh, 3,000 uh, random surveys issued. We received 686 back. That is incredible anytime you get above that 10% threshold. So uh, received a good sampling. Then of the non-random uh, non -random results, excuse me, um, yeah, non-random results, which were the uncontrolled, uh, we had 119 uh, results uh, come back to us. And it, we want to note that 72%, which, or 72, which is 60.5%, were between the ages of 16 and 18 years of age, and most of those were female. So that was interesting to see uh, those results. Now let's focus on a sample snapshot survey result. Snapshot survey results were categorized by several times per week, a few times per month, at least once a month, less than once a month, and seldom or never. What we did, here's a snapshot, uh, snapshot of, of 
of results by based upon respondents who would use each feature at least once a month. So I took the middle of the road, and you can kind of see what are uh, what indoor features, outdoor features, as well as niche features, uh, folks were uh, looking at. And again, that's the non-random. Now let's take a look uh, of the 119. Uh, random survey selected, here's a sample of per, uh, percentage of respondents who would use each feature at least once a month. And you can see those results there, um, top 10s, top 12s, and other top 10s, uh, indoor, outdoor, and niche features. Next, uh, we had a number of questions related to the types of costs that residents would be willing to pay for the purchase for usage. This specific snapshot um, asked residents to tell us the types of passes they would be willing to purchase. And as you can see, 34% of respondents indicated they would prefer to pay for an annual family pass. 12% um, of respondents indicated they would prefer to pay for an annual adult pass. 25% of respondents indicated they would prefer to pay per visit. Uh, so you can see uh, those are, these are good data snapshots here. Of, of our residents and what they'd be willing to pay. Again, I do want to emphasize that the random and non-random snapshot result that you've just seen uh, are only a broad sampling of results that give you a picture of the direction of the direction that residents are saying. There's much more data that we're currently processing uh, with our consultant McAdams as well as Pros Consulting who is finalizing our needs assessment uh, and ETC has now finalized that core sampling of the um, random uncontrolled survey so that we get a greater picture. It combines all those questions into one so you get one full graph to know what you're looking at. We'll be uh, going over these uh, in detail at our next uh, Recreation and Park Advisor Board meeting. Uh, real quick, uh, as it pertains to the Advisor Board, uh, we'll work closely with the Advisor Board to focus on um, program things that's going to mold our park design with features that will deliver priority number one, our own community residents, and priority number two, visitors from outside of our community. That is our sole for focus. What you have here are program themes that include community, civic, and sports, and niche. As of today, we got in touch with our pros consultant, and we're actually looking at three other uh, community type clusters that could fit in this park which are exercise and fitness, outdoor recreation, and aquatics. So our challenge is going to be how are we going to mesh these clusters together to find the best result that's going to create the most positive impact uh, for our community. In conclusion, I do want to emphasize how the recreation bond will be spent. Uh, there's been a lot of questions about that. So the total recreation bond was $5 million that was voted on. Of that $5 million, we only have $3.96 million designated specifically for the park project. There is no other funding source available by the county. There are other potential outside funding sources that include PARDF, which we will look to apply for uh, as a part of the uh, phase two uh, project for 2018. Uh, there are facility rights um, that we could look at, nonprofit foundations, community organizations, and possible corporate grant opportunities. Also of the $5 million, we have $1.04 million designated specifically for recreation needs. Uh, we've developed a milestone schedule for that already, and we looked at a projected date for grant applications in January of 2018. Um, this concludes our annual highlights and repurposing project update. I do want to thank my staff and their countless time, hard work, uh, and insatiable desire to offer exceptional recreation opportunities to our citizens. Uh, and on behalf of our team, we want to thank those volunteers, uh, coaches that have stood with us since our inception uh, for all that they have do, uh, for all that they do for our programming, which ultimately fo fosters our mission to enrich the quality of life in Davie County. I'll uh, be happy to take any questions that you may have.
committee. When is that next advisory committee? Next advisory board committee is May 8th, Monday, May 8th at 6 o'clock at Brock Recreation Center. Just a reminder for the board, Mr. Chairman, is uh, obviously the work that's occurring in the Recreation and Parks Board um, will be to kind of summarize all this data, um, sort through it, try to uh, understand what it means as it relates to the master plan, uh, and then come back to uh, you at the conclusion of that process with some very uh, solid recommendations as it, as we begin to mold and unfold that uh, master plan. I know uh, uh, some of you represent us on that uh, during that process and on those committees, and so uh, what you see and have seen before you in your packets uh, is, is really kind of what we've heard early on. So we wanted you to have at least a chance tonight to, to have those results. Uh, they're, they're fresh and new and uh, something that we continue to sort through ourselves. So we're still very early in this process. I know there's lots of varying thoughts about what the final product should look like, and I think that's why you created this advisory board to make recommendations back to you. Uh, so as uh, Mr. Moore mentioned, at this point we uh, obviously haven't uh, shared uh, with the board this presentation, but we will do that at the next meeting and uh, solicit their feedback as uh, the same that we're doing with you tonight. Again, that, those are what was presented tonight are just a sampling of snapshots results. Um, board, the advisory board will get the full breadth of the report as well as you will see that at the conclusion or when we go for the final master plan approval uh, this fall, uh, you, will see, you will see all those results as well. We realize that this is a, a living plan and That's that right. it changes, has changed already considerably and probably will before the final product comes out. But do you have any anticipated date as to when we can expect a, a final plan? I would guesstimate sometime uh, September meeting uh, would likely be a final master plan uh, presentation uh, for approval. That is, uh, that is scheduled within the contract with Rehabs. In the repur the, the uh, demolition of the building, now, when is that going to, when's that process? Going That'll to start. That's going to be not necessarily tied to the master plan. That's correct. That's totally separate. Uh, that, that process to begin in September, if I'm correct, Dr. Harkness is, is here. In September, if that demo period, there's a period between September and January for that demo to happen. And the... Uh, speed in which that is done is really relevant to to the sub consultants uh, weather of course in the fall uh, so it looks like they've got a fluid contract there that uh, should be done uh, in, in that length of time with no problem that's good information appreciate you sharing that and all the work you've put into that and clearing up some potential misconceptions that's out there so uh, thank you uh, we ask if the public ever has any questions don't hesitate to call me uh, if I don't know the answer I'm gonna get the answer for you in a, in a short matter of time thank you so much thank you all right next we move we have three proclamations we would like to enter into the record this evening the first one is the older Americans month and I'm going to call on Mr. Poindexter. Thank you, Chairman Renniger. Um, I might point out that I read this to the seniors out at the Senior Center today, and one of the ladies there corrected something on it. She said uh, this should be older and wiser. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Americans yeah. Month. Older Americans Month 2017, a proclamation. Whereas Davy County includes older Americans who richly contribute to our community, and whereas we acknowledge that what it means to age has changed for the better, whereas Davy County Senior Services is committed to supporting older adults as they take charge of their health, explore new opportunities and activities, and focus on independence, and whereas Davy County can provide opportunities to enrich the lives of individuals of all ages by involving older adults in the redefinition of aging in our community, promoting home and community-based services that support independent living, 
encouraging older adults to speak up for themselves and others, and providing opportunities for older adults to share their experiences. Now, therefore, Terry N. Reniger, Chairman of Davie County Board of County Commissioners, does hereby proclaim May 2017 to be the Older Americans Month. We urge every resident to take time during this month to acknowledge older adults and the people who serve them as influential and vital parts of our community. Dated this first day of May 2017. Mr. Chairman, if I might uh, call um Ms. Sharon Allard, uh, who's in the crowd up to receive the proclamation from uh, Commissioner Poindexter. She's here representing uh, our senior center, and so we thank you for what each of you do for all of us. So thank you, Mr. Poindexter, thank if you'd you. hand her that uh, yes, official proclamation. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you for what you do for us. All right. Second proclamation we have is the National Day of Prayer. I'll call on uh, Commissioner Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, National Day of Prayer, Thursday, May 4, 2017. Whereas each of us is an author in our collective American story and in participating in our national discourse to address some of our nation's greatest challenges, we are reminded of the blessing we have to live in a land where we are able to freely express the beliefs we hold in our hearts. As a nation free to practice our faith as we choose, we must remember those around the world who are not afforded this freedom, and we must recommit to building a society where we all can enjoy this liberty and live their lives in peace and dignity. And whereas, from our nation's humble beginnings, prayer has guided our leaders and played a vital role in the life and history of the United States. Americans of many faiths share the profound conviction that God listens to the voice of his children and pours his grace upon those who seek him in prayer. By surrendering our lives to our loving Father, we learn to serve his eternal purposes and we are strengthened, refreshed, and ready for all that may come. And whereas, in times of steady calm and extraordinary change of light, Americans of all walks of life have long turned to prayer to seek refuge, demonstrate gratitude, and discover peace. Sustaining us through great uncertainty and moments of sorrow, prayer allows us an outlet of introspection and for expressing our hopes, desires, and fears. It offers strength in the face of hardship and redemption when we falter. Our country was founded on the idea of religious freedom, and we have long upheld the belief that how we pray and whether we pray are matters reserved for an individual's own conscience. On National Day of Prayer, we rededicate ourselves to extending this freedom to all people. And whereas America trusts in the abiding power of prayer and asks for the wisdom to discern God's will, in times of joy and trial. As we observe this National Day of Prayer, we recognize our dependence on the Almighty. We thank Him for the many blessings He has bestowed upon us, and we put our country's future in His hands. Every day, women and men use the wisdom gained from humble prayer to spread kindness and to make our world a better place. And whereas the threats of poverty, violence, and war around the world are all too real, our faith and our earnest prayers can be cures for the fear we feel as we confront these realities. Helping us resist despair, paralysis, or cynicism, prayer offers a powerful alternative to pessimism. Through prayer, we often gain the insight to learn from our mistakes, the motivation to always be better, and the courage to stand up for what is right, even when it is not popular. And whereas the Congress, by public law 100-307, uh, as amended, has called on our nation to reaffirm the role of prayer in our society by recognizing each year a National Day of Prayer, on this National Day of Prayer, we ask God's continued blessings on our country on our county and country. Now, therefore, the Davie County Board of Commissioners do hereby proclaim May 4th, 
2017 as a national day of prayer and ask our citizens to give thanks, each according to his or her own faith, for the freedoms and blessings we have received and for God's continued guidance, comfort, and protection. We invite Davie County citizens to join in observing this day to give thanks with appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities for, for our many freedoms and blessings and join in asking for God's continued guidance, mercy, and protection as we seek a more just world. Dated this first day of May, 2017, Terry N. Reniger, Chairman, Davie County Board of Commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right. The third proclamation is the Public Service Recognition Week of May 7th to May 13th. Mr. Eller. We'd like to recognize our staff for Public Service Recognition Week, which is May 7th through the 13th, as you mentioned, and I'd like to read the proclamation honoring our staff as follows. Whereas citizens of Davie County are served each and every single day by public servants at the federal, state, county, and city level, these unsung heroes do the work that keeps our state and nation and county working. And whereas public employees take not only jobs but oaths, and whereas many public servants, including our officers, military, firefighters, healthcare professionals, and others risk their lives each day in service to the people of Davie County. And whereas public servants include teachers, doctors, uh, scientists, nurses, safety inspectors, laborers, computer <coughs> technicians, social workers, and countless other occupations who consistently provide the diverse services demanded by the citizens of Davie County of their government with efficiency and integrity. And whereas without these public servants at every level, continuity would be impossible uh, without democracy that regularly changes its leaders and elected officials. So therefore, the Davie County Board of Commissioners do hereby proclaim May 7th through 13th of 2017 as Public Service Recognition Week in this county. And we call upon all citizens to recognize the accomplishments and contributions of our county government employees and other government employees at all levels, federal, state, county, and towns, dated this first day of May 2017. Uh, by Mr. Terry Reniger, Chairman of the Davie County Board of Commissioners. I'd like, Mr. Chairman, for our staff to stand uh, who are here tonight, and uh, let's just honor their contributions to Davie County. So, folks, y'all would stand. Thank y'all very much. All right. Thank you. And that's something that we say thank you to our staff, but probably not enough, but we appreciate your dedication. Next, we move to a public hearing. Um, road naming rights, call on Mr. Gallimore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and board. Uh, you have uh, three road names uh, proposed tonight, um, and you can hear them all at one time, or you can hear them independently. Uh, two of the road names are linked together. Um, but the road names in order are Lucy Lane, Old Stone Trail, and Peso Forest Trail. And they're located, uh, Lucy Lane and Old Stone Trail are located off of People's Creek Road in the Advance community. And Peso Forest Trail is located off of Peso Lane in the Moxville uh, community. These road names were petitioned by the property owners. And uh, as part of your agenda packet, you have a copy of those petitions signed by the property owners. Uh, Lucy Lane and Old Stone Trail were proposed uh, after one of the owners uh, applied for a building permit. And at looking uh, at the properties, looking at what's already there, uh, staff uh, spoke with the property owner uh, who was applying for the permit and said we need to name the road. Uh, at which time a uh, petition was provided and the owner and um, met with other owners and obtained those signatures on the petition and uh, presented it to us for uh, both Lucy Lane and Old Stone Trail. Peso Forest Trail, uh, again, is uh, based on a petition or application for a building permit, and a petition was provided to the owner, and those were completed and brought back to us. Um, we then presented these to the Davie County Planning Board at their February uh, meeting, and uh, there was no one to speak in favor or opposed to naming these roads. Um, notices were mailed out uh, for that meeting as well. Um, we did not receive any um, comments in favor or against, 
Um, so the planning board recommended to approve uh, these um, road names that you have, um, seven in favor and none opposed. Subsequent to that, uh, we bring them to you, bring these road names to you, um, and uh, placed an advertisement, a public notice in the newspaper for two weeks as required, mailed notices to the property owners that will uh, be affected, and um, placed this on your agenda uh, after the um, board reviewed as part of their agenda process. Um, notices again were mailed to the property owners, um, informing them of the road names for uh, uh, public hearing tonight. and. Um, up until just very recently, we didn't receive any uh, calls or communication uh, regarding these road names. Uh, I will say that one of these roads, actually the two roads, Lucy Lane and um, Old Stone Trail, are required uh, for one of the owners to continue on and, and uh, finish their building uh, process of their new home. So um, we're sort of, they're limited, we're limited in proceeding on with the uh, addressing uh, without these road names to be approved. So um, I can try to answer any other questions um, if you have any about these uh, roads, or you can hear from the public, and then I can answer any questions. I have a question. Just a second, sir. It's a public hearing. You'll have an opportunity for the public hearing uh, to, to be heard. No problem. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Gallimore at this point? Could you repeat what you were saying about the building permit and uh, that holding up? Yes. So um, Old Stone Trail, which is the road, which uh, proposed road, which leads to the north off of Lucy Lane, uh, is the road that will serve the new construction. Uh, the property owners uh, need, obviously, need an address for their home, and because the road, there are already too many structures on these private roads we need to readdress the road, or need to apply a road name um, to the road, assign new addresses on them, and put up a sign uh, to help with 911 services and things like that. So the road names uh, really need to be approved in order to proceed on with assigning the new address to the, uh, to the property. Okay. Are there current road names for the names? Are these new roads, or are they being renamed? There are no current roads. Uh, there are two existing dwellings that have, are addressed off of People's Creek Road. Uh, so they will be readdressed on these new road names, but there are no existing road names um, for these private driveways. So this is part of our, our addressing process to assign these uh, road names and, and issue addresses for them. So what is Barney Family Trail and what is <coughs> Deer Run Trail? Are they? Those are likely suggested names. Okay. So we asked for uh, petitioners to give us several suggested names, and we review those and come back with the ones that are most appropriate and create the least conflict. And so um, that's what you have before you is Lucy Lane, Old Stone Trail, and Peso Forest Trail. So on the petition, you may see other potential names listed, but those are not the ones before you tonight. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Gallimore at this time? Okay, thank you. Okay, this is a public hearing, so Mr. Vogler. The chairman has announced this is the hour and day of the public hearing under the Davie County current code of ordinance for proposed changes of three formerly unnamed private roads serving two or more residency to name roads specifically added enhanced E911 addresses for residents on Lucy, Lucy Lane located at 1454 People's Creek Road, Old Stone Trail located at 1466 People's Creek Road, and Paso Forest Trail located at 181 Paso Lane. There has been duly published in the Davie County Enterprise a notice of hearing. Uh, Davie County Enterprise having a general circulation in Davie County is required by North Carolina General Statute Section 168-20G of the Act, and the clerk to the board has attached the affidavit showing publication in said paper on a date at least 10 days prior to this hearing. I'd ask that all who wish to comment at this public hearing come forward, uh, step up to the podium, state your full name for the board, and then comment on the proposals. My name is Rami Barney, and uh, 
I'm on the property the owners on uh, Lucy Lane and Lucy. Lucy is my sister, and I'm her power of attorney. Lucy's mailbox has been 1458 ever since it was numbers put up. And that was the petition. But now tonight it would be uh, Fourteen fifty-four, and my—I wanted to be. We all wanted to be a good neighbor, but somehow or another, it was fourteen fifty-eight. A lot of years before it was in uh, fifteen uh, fifty-four, and some way or another, when the numbers gone out, it got Lucy's. Mailbox address is here, and the other guy is right here. See, and for some reason or another, it was numbered less. But my problem is, she would have to change all of her mailing addresses, and, and and that's I'm for the roads and all like that. But why should her mailing address be changed? Because it was there before any of this ever gone up. Understand what I'm talking about? I think so. <laughs> the, your sister was there first, and you're questioning why her number would be changed versus someone that's new to the area. Right. And when you signed the petition, you understood the number would be the same. Yeah, right? yeah, I didn't. You know, they asked me to, the other property owner said, uh, "Why do you think we ought to have to? Because it's two uh, two houses on the same road, so I'd have to build down." Uh, not, and I was, you know, said sure, you know, and uh, really at this stage, truth about it, I didn't pay any attention to it. We got this notice about tonight, and uh, so that's why I called Richard. Richard called some of y'all. Uh, but uh, it just seems funny <laughs> that if you had the same address and nothing is moved, why you would have to change your address? So. Hopefully, Mr. Gallimore can explain that to us when we when we get through with the public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Any others wish to come forward to comment at this public hearing? Mr. Chairman, seeing none, I would now turn the public hearing back to the board to you, Mr. Chairman. Close the public comment section of this public hearing and provide you with the opportunity to discuss among yourselves or ask other questions with regards to whether or not any action is be taken at this time. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll declare the public hearing closed. And Mr. Gallimore, um, could you address Mr. Barney's question there? I will try. Let me um, see if I can use a picture to <coughs> illustrate what we're talking about. So the issue really, I think, comes down to whether the road name is not whether the road name is going to exist, but whether the address, the number, uh, the number for the existing house will change. And this has to do with the addressing system that we have. And road numbers or house numbers uh, on roads begin at 100 and increment or uh, increase as you travel along the road. So every 26 feet, there's a pair of numbers. So the further you are along the road, the higher your number becomes. So if I show you where these um, roads are proposed, and you can see the addresses here. That's right in this area. So what we have, I don't know if you can see this very well, but you can see 1458 which is here, 1454 is here, and 1466, which is the new proposed dwelling. So we give temporary addresses for new construction so that they can proceed on in lieu of waiting for the road name to be approved. Uh, it's more conducive or helpful for the property owner uh, knowing that we need to name the road, and it lets their process move forward. 
So what you see here is uh, from People's Creek Road here, there is a driveway which runs along the southern edge of these properties. And this property, this, this series of lots in this area are the Barney, is Barney property. And over time, it's been um, sold and conveyed. And so the, the people building the house are building on this lot, which is 1466. So what we have are the two prior addresses, 1454, 1458, really share a driveway. They share this driveway coming from People's Creek Road to this point, at which point 1454 bears off or turns off to the left and travels to the north back into this property. So this lot where the new house is being built needs an address to be um, from one of these private roads. And based on where they're building, which is on the back of the lot, they've indicated uh, they want to be on this private road here, this, this northern section. So we have a road, a driveway, that has to have a name, this, this lower section or, or southern driveway here. And we have another road which needs a name. By assigning a name to this section here, which we're proposing as Lucy Lane, or the owners, I should say, are proposing as Lucy Lane, that means that the distance from People's Creek Road back to this home uh, is something less than three miles. 1458 is just over three miles from the beginning of People's Creek Road. So this is clearly not three miles, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 or 151, 153, something like that. We won't know, we don't address the homes with the new road names until it's actually approved by this board. So if you approve the road names, we'll put them on the map and figure out what the new number will be, but it won't be 1458. It can't be. Mathematically, it, it can't be 1458 because that throws the entire system out the window at that point. So. Um, 1466, People's Creek Road will become something on Old Stone Trail. 1454, People's Creek Road will become something, a number on Old Stone Trail. And it's, it's based on the measurements. So we figure out where the driveway is going to be and we calculate the address at that point. So once the road name is approved, then we assign the new road name. Um, it is an effect of new development as properties develop and houses are built, roads become named and we have to assign new addresses to those houses, um, even existing ones that had an address for a long time. It'll also be a three digit number, won't it? Yes, sir. It'll be something like 150 or 149 or one, I don't know the exact number. I could probably figure it out here if I had a calculator, but it, it's something like that. It'll be based on the distance. If it's, you know, 800 feet, it'll be, you know, less than 200. So if, you know, if it was a quarter mile, that would be the address of 200. If it starts at 100, there's 100 ad 400 addresses in a mile. So, but it would be, it would be a three-digit number. And it'll have a number and the name. That's yes, sir. It'll be something like 149 Lucy Lane. Right, okay. Something so like it will that. no longer be considered a, a People's Creek Road address. That's correct. As it is now. It would have to take the name that, that you approved tonight or that you approved. And this spur road that runs off of it, you'd start with the 100 where that, it runs off of that's right, Lucy Lane. Right at this point, yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. And it, looking down the road, and we had this discussion with property owners. Nobody likes to think that property will ever develop, but it does. These lots will eventually develop, not today or next month or next year or 10 years maybe, but at some point somebody will build on those. If we have a road name in place, then we can just assign numbers off of that road name at that point, and we don't have to readdress. You know, again, that's what we do. We don't like changing people's address. That's not what we do. We, we try to do everything we can to avoid that, but when we have new houses, we have to assign addresses to them. But it does become a safety issue once you na once you change the road name and the EMS and everybody else needs to find that yes, place. Yes, that's correct. And we provide that to 911. It goes out to all the service providers, the postal service, telephone companies. Um, it goes to the sheriff's office, the fire departments. Um, we send out lots and lots of emails and maps and letters. And, and there's plenty of time to make these changes. I've been doing this for almost 24 years now and nobody likes to change the address. I know it's difficult and it's time consuming, 
It's a lot easier today than it was 24 years ago with electronic communication, things like that. But uh, I don't mean to minimize that other than to say I understand it's difficult. And, um, but we try our best to assist those owners to work through the process of changing the address. Um, our, what we focus on is 911 response. That there's no confusion if that emergency uh, provider, um, EMS, whoever, leaves People's Creek Road, they know which way to go. We don't want them to try to guess, is it to the left, is it straight? Because if somebody's laying in the floor and can't speak, they can't give directions. And most of our calls are medical, and those involve people who can't speak. So. I thought I heard Mr. Barney's point to be that he thought his number would stay the same. Was that your point? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, you knew that road I, name was going to change. Actually, whatever happened. You know, I don't, I don't want to mess with y'all up. No, but, no. But actually, what, it, it, was, it was one person there. And when somebody else bothered a lot, if we gave them easement to, to what's going to be the Stone Ridge Road, they, instead of but what I'm hearing is regardless of what they're currently numbered it's going to be a whole new numbered system That's when correct. these two roads come in right what we've got is what we got in the mail and right. the first thing that we received showed us that Lucy Lane located on 1458 uh, People's Creek Road, which that is correct. That's where her home is. Right. It's 1458 People's Creek Road, currently address. Our first said that, and that was correct. But what we received the other day said Lucy Lane is located on 1454 People's Creek Road. And that is very confusing when when the first one said the old stone trail was going to be 1454, now it's got it right, right backwards. And what I want so to learn, very confusing. and I, I get your point because you got, you know, one information one time and one the next, but what I think I'm hearing from John is that the road name's going to change one way or another, and it's just a question of what the road name's going to be, right? Correct. I mean, because we've got new development, you got two roads that got to be named one way or another. And then, if I'm hearing correctly, the numbers have all got to change too. That's so correct. even if it was 1458 or whatever, it's going to be a new number. It just has to be, and it's going to be a three-digit di number. And so number. her mailing address would also change, yes. not just EMS. Or right, but that's going to happen regardless because we've got two roads that got to be renamed. And that's, as John's saying, the cost of progress. So I, I, I hear what you're saying, I understand it completely, but I think what John's saying is, regardless of whether it's 1458 or 1454, all those numbers are going to be reoriented and everybody's address is going to change. Well, that was what was confusing. I, and I was confused too, so I, I fully understand. 1454 and 1458 both go away. That's correct. Yeah, exactly. And that's, I think, where... I mean, we're clear. I mean, I don't... Okay. But I wasn't, but I, I thank you for <laughs> bringing it up. That's why we're well, here. Right. I just don't want to have all these people have to change addresses on all a number of places right. whenever. But sadly, I, I think with two new road names, that's going to happen one way or another. But you only want to change them one time. Yeah, I mean, twice. once we change it, it's going to be done, right, John? Once for that. Well, I get it. And our biggest concern from a staff perspective was to make sure that we could properly respond if there was an emergency at the residence. Well, I mean, sure. that's extremely important. But, you know, we did have a petition that was signed, the road names presented to the planning board, um, and then the planning board unanimously approved this request. So I, I can see how that would be very confusing. Confusing, confusing, but maybe we have cleared it up. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Any other questions for Mr. Gallimore? Any comments from the board? Uh, 
I do have one other question I would like to ask regarding that. I, I noticed uh, the road that turned off to go down to what's currently 1454 People's Creek Road, whatever, or Mountain View, whatever, that turned off mm -hmm. of Lucy Lane. Does Lucy, since we only have one house down there at the, end of, at the very end of Lucy Lane now, does it still become Lucy Lane all the way down to that house or just to that intersection? We, we would take Lucy Lane all the way to that last lot, if you can see on this map. We would take it all the way out here okay. because it, that's the easement okay. for that property um, that we're aware of. Okay, I could see where if we didn't do that, then it would be sometime come back to change everything again. No, we, we, would, we could extend it if we needed to, but we wouldn't have to change anything. Um, so we would take it beyond the house that's there um, and could stop it if, if that's where the road stopped or we could take, we, we try to stop it where the actual access or the drivable area ends, if that makes sense. We don't want to give the impression that you can keep going if you can't. So, but we would take it out past that house. Okay. Yeah. It's, a, it's a driveway except the one lot. And it's easy for the next lot. Yeah, and it's hard to tell from this photograph, but it's there is a driveway that comes about right in here uh, to this house. So <coughs> this is it's grown up, but there is an easement there. But when this lot next this next lot over to the right there gets developed, it will be correct. One one forty or one fifty. Whatever or the next number yeah. or the <laughs> yeah. calculates to be. Yes, right. All right. Any other discussion? Okay. Seeing none, we have a recommendation before us to rename these three roads. Would someone like to make that motion? I make the motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor of renaming the three roads as presented, raise your hand. Okay, that does pass. Five zero. Thank you, Mr. Barney. Ms. <coughs> Barney for your input. All right. Next, we move to the consent agenda. And, uh, Trust everyone's had a chance to look at that. Do we have any questions or concerns about that this evening? Mr. Chairman, um, I think I would uh, like to hear a little bit of explanation on the sewer extension policy. I know it's a, um, an improvement, I guess, or a revision over what we had previously and just like to understand uh, how the uh, new policy or the proposed policy differs from the prior policy. Sure. Commission Baird, and why? I'd be happy to do that. So uh, as a result of our, our meeting last month, you asked us to go back and uh, take a look at the policy as it relates to some confusing language uh, and also uh, to better clarify that for you and also for me to have a conversation uh, with uh, for me to run and Moxville about uh, our proposal as well. So I have talked to those managers about this as well. Uh, but tonight, just to clarify what you see uh, before you on consent, is really uh, a recommended uh, recommendation as far as the uh, proposal for the policy to upgrade it based on what you asked us to do last time. I've uh, consulted with our uh, staff, and, and I could say we spent a, a lot of time on this to make sure that uh, we made this what we felt uh, it needed to be and that you would uh, be pleased with. So. Uh, the purpose of this policy is really to provide guidelines as it relates to uh, the connection, expansion, and extension of water and sewer services in both Northeast Davy Sewer District and uh, our county in, in particular. And I'll draw your attention um, to items um, R through V. Uh, that's really the extent. I mean, we made minor modifications throughout the, uh, the proposed policy. Uh, to just provide clarity to you uh, and provide more consistency as well with some of the uh, uh, verbatim that we used. But uh, what we did was we looked at uh, a, a way to uh, give you, the board, uh, an opportunity to look at the requests as they come in before the approval 
of any connection, expansion, or extensions to the county's water and or sewer uh, by a customer or a potential customer uh, which have requested an allocation of 5,000 gallons or more per day. Uh, and that in that case, the commissioners and the board of the North, Northeast Davy Sewer District at your discretion can require any impact assessment study uh, of those said infrastructures. Uh, in conjunction with that, obviously, we would uh, re post the request um, on our website uh, and then also uh, look at the allocation that we're proposing uh, based on a formula that we came up with that uh, our planning department um, helped us with, and, and Mr. Meanwell, appreciate his help uh, with that as well, and Mr. Lambert and Mr. Vogler and I all met to look at this. So what we're proposing, particularly in uh, Section U uh, of the policy, is that 70% of the remaining allocation uh, that we have for commercial and or industrial use um, will be allocated, uh, and 30% of that remaining allocation shall be used for residential. So 70% for commercial and industrial, 30% for um, uh, the residential. And then the 30% residential allocation will be based upon uh, a formula wherein 60% of that shall be used for single family dwellings and then 40% for multifamily use. That is based on data uh, that we, we use to make that so that wasn't just haphazardly chosen as far as those percentages. And mind you, this uh, policy that uh, you ask us to uh, develop is something that's a bridge. Uh, it's really a bridge to a comprehensive land use development plan and unified uh, uh, ordinances that we hope to partner with our towns uh, on as we move forward with uh, Piedmont Regional Tri Council and our EDC partners to really start uh, doing some smart growth planning. Uh, and we feel like until we get that comprehensive <coughs> land use plan and those unified ordinances developed and done, uh, this policy will help us. Uh, as we consider those allocation uh, requests. Uh, so I would imagine once those, those plans get in place and once our East Davy sewer project gets up and running, you know, we'll revisit this and have a different kind of conversation. But until then, um, uh, we feel confident that this uh, policy meets the needs that you directed us to do at our last meeting and feel like we followed those steps. And I, again, want to thank our staff for their involvement with this. And have you had conversation with our towns about this and whether they uh, could buy into this kind of approach? I did discuss uh, with our, our town managers at uh, uh, Moxville and also Bermuda Run and shared with them uh, this process and uh, they felt like we're able to partner through that uh, in any way that we can and we're all very committed to continuing to partner on this comprehensive plan as we uh, move down the road but uh, we don't see this being an impediment uh, to anything in the meantime. Take any other questions that the board may have. Okay, anybody else have any questions on the revised sewer policy? Uh, I think it's an excellent job, and I appreciate the committee looking at this as well, the commissioner committee, and, and all the hard work that went into it. All right, any other issues on the consent agenda? I hate to be <laughs> monopolized here. Please, uh, anybody else step in. But uh, the um, clarification on the uh, audits of the fire departments, if, if there could be an explanation as to the rationale behind the audits and the, uh, the details of what the audits will entail and um, you know, what we're trying to accomplish here. Sure, of course. I think that uh, during the uh, budget process last year, some board members were interested in getting some more accounting for uh, the tax dollars that are spent at the fire departments. Uh, currently, they only, as far as I have seen, have gotten compilations in the past. So we set aside some funds in the budget to do an audit, but upon further <coughs> review, we decided it would be better course of action to do agreed upon procedures where they focus on certain procedures at each of the fire departments so we have a, when we send out the proposal we have a proposed list of agreed upon procedures and that would include uh, examining a certain percentage 
of cash disbursements to make sure that uh, the money that we're given the fire departments are used for fire services. So this is not spelled out, but to the accountants that we've you know talked to, do they know how to do a, a, a drill down, so to speak, Absolutely. to make sure they do a, a random yes. sample? Yes, I had I had very you know a, a lot of interest in this when I put it out, and I talked to several different firms, and. Um, uh, the part of the suggested amount is, you know, we just take a certain percentage and then, you know, if something comes up that, you know, they didn't spend the funds for fire services, then they could, you know, expand the sample, of course. They wouldn't just drop it at that point, but they would expand the sample to include however much that we deem necessary. So. And how do you make sure that you, you cover enough different aspects of it? I don't know what the terminology is in accounting. Maybe chairman can speak to this but to make sure that you get you know a different when i used to scout cotton we used to look at different parts of the field right. to find out whether they were bold right and it just depends on different firms i think as far as what uh how they would choose you know some of them would choose a random sample some of them might pick a couple of different months of transactions i think it varies from firm to firm and mr Reniger might have a better idea of that than than i would yeah it would vary from firm to firm but Back to the agreed upon procedures versus an audit, we just felt like that the agreed upon procedures from a return on our investment, so to speak, we were going to get more coverage by doing the agreed upon procedures than the true audit. If we do the audit, you're going to spend a lot of time on administrative steps that are not seen by the public, and but we're spending dollars. So but with the agreed upon procedures, they will come to us with what they plan to do, and if they do, Sure they won't, but if they do find something that needs to be furthered, they will come to us and get uh, approved to do whatever other procedures they deem necessary to drill down further. Don't anticipate that at all, but that is part of the beauty of the uh, agreed upon procedures. It's just, uh, again, trying to, we entered into this to, felt like we had a duty to, for the taxpayer's dollars, but we also have a duty on the taxpayer's dollars to spend them on the, the lease accounting procedures so and it hasn't been talked about yet but um, the fire departments they will be um, selected on a random basis as far as who will get audited or agreed upon procedures applied so so how many years back or do you just go back to the what we're looking at is that not everyone has the same year in so most of them have the same fiscal year that we do the ending June 30th there is a couple that have a year ending December 31st. So we're looking at the year ending 2016, whether it be June 30th, 2016, or December 31st, 2016. So that's the year that we're starting with. But the agreed upon procedures would only be applied to a given year. Right. It wouldn't be a multi-year engagement. So we're not looking back in time. We're looking at what they have done in the prior fiscal year. Right, prior just in the prior year. year. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And y'all are confident this is going to accomplish our goals for uh, for making sure that the taxpayer's money is, is spent wisely. I'm confident that this is a better use of our dollars than a true audit. Yes, sir. Okay. And why is that? Well, again, with an audit, you're going to spend a lot of dollars doing administrative functions just to produce an audit report. And when you do that, those dollars are going to not be seen by the public, but yet we're going to get a larger bill. And I think we accomplished the same thing by the agreed upon procedures because the accountant, the firm that we're contracting with, they're not putting an opinion on it per se. So there's they're, less risk to them. They're looking to see if there's a problem. If there's right. not a problem, then need to look further, correct? Right. It's, exact, it's more focused, if you will, than an audit would be a whole lot broader. And more formalistic. Right. Definitely mm -hmm. more formalistic. <laughs> and much more expensive. Right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Time-wise. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Um, Ms. West, we, we did have contracts that were uh, submitted by our fire department um, partners, and, all, and this was part of the contractual um, agreement. Correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. okay. And this particular process as yes. well as part of the contract. So yes, this sir. is contractual that we're going to go through this particular process. Yes, right? sir. And we can revisit those contracts later if need be. Correct. Absolutely. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other 
questions about the fire department agreed upon procedures. Okay. All right. Any other concerns about the consent agenda or questions? Not concerns, but clarifications. Seeing none, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Motion to have a second. 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 Any further discussion? If not, all in favor, raise your hand. That does pass 5-0. Thank you for the discussion. All right. Next, we move to the county manager's report. Mr. Treller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a few things, uh, uh, many of which you've all already covered, but I wanted to highlight a couple of other things. Uh, we are to the point of uh, going through our space study assessment that was part of the consent agenda. Uh, we feel very confident that will help us decide as we move forward with our capital improvement plan uh, over the next few years that we make uh, good informed decisions uh, and we want to thank staff uh, for their work on that uh, in our, our finance office, uh, Ms. Hendricks and uh, uh, a group of, of our staff uh, led that process and so we thank them uh, for their work on that. So I'm, we're excited to get that process up and running. I know many of you have asked about that. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I wanted to point out as part of the consent as well, uh, I know uh, Cam Sloan is here and, and we appreciate the work that our, our Sheriff's uh, Office does for us each and every day. You'll, you'll see part of uh, uh, the Stepping Up initiative there. I uh, just want to acknowledge our Sheriff's Office there and what we're trying to accomplish. As you know, there's uh, mental illness and behavioral health issues in our jails across the country has become quite an issue. This initiative will kind of help. Davie County uh, more formalize the process as I understand uh, from Sheriff Hartman uh, our, our Sheriff's Office was already doing many things in this regard to stepping up initiative and this just kind of formalizes it and, and lets uh, the County Commissioners Association of North Carolina know that you know we are doing a lot in Davie County and signing on as a stepping up uh, initiative county so I want to thank Sheriff Hartman and uh, Mr. Sloan for uh, their work and partnership throughout that process. Um, just wanted to thank all of you who uh, helped us uh, get to the courthouse uh, dome topping. I think that was a great event for our community, and uh, I want to thank Mr. Meadwell and uh, John Fuller for their help in making that happen. And then uh, lastly, just to let uh, you know that we're continuing to move forward with our strategic planning process. We have uh, two presentations uh, planned for uh, May with some community partners and also uh, uh, one of our towns and we're continuing to have those kind of conversations so uh, that I'll be able to over the next few months again get you a plan based on feedback that we're hearing so we can make some uh, strategic planning and critical decisions uh, uh, hopefully before the holidays get here so all that work is still in process and I appreciate all of our staff and their hard work uh, as we move that forward so uh, with that I'll conclude my report thank you just a quick question though the workings, the clock workings on the dome. I've had a couple of people ask me about that. Is that what's the status of that? Yes, it is electronic and it will chime. Mr. B. Will, do you have any updates? Tomorrow. Huh? They're installing tomorrow. Installing tomorrow. Okay. There you go. There you Hot go. Hot off the press. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Any old business to come before us this evening? All right. How about any new business? Move to Commissioner's comments, Mr. Jones. No comments, Mr. Chairman, other than to thank all of our citizens, including our staff, for making this just a wonderful county to raise a family in. Really appreciate y'all. Bear? I'll be brief. Um, for once, the, uh, I want to thank all staff and uh, all the public that participates in all different boards and, and uh, organizations um, and just very briefly I, I attended farm day this past week and met some honeybees and goats and a horse named Stormy so let me commend that to your attention if you ever get the chance all right Mr. Poindexter I'd like to say thank you to everybody for being here tonight uh, the Barneys hope you come back more often and see us um, I got the opportunity today to go to the senior center and and uh, do the older citizens proclamation for the this year and uh, or for this month 
and it was nice to see the folks out there, the care that they exhibit toward the people that they serve at the Senior Center. And I'd like to say thank you to, to all the people out there and to all, all our employees. I know everyone here is uh, good conservative employees and, and serve the public well. Thank you. Ferguson. I would just like to thank everyone, the staff particularly. I know that uh, this is the time of year when you're going through your budgets and doing all your work and there's a, there's a very, very busy time for everyone. And what you do is very important to 40 some thousand people in this county. And we need to always remember that, that it's just not the ones that come out for these meetings, but there's a lot of other people that we've got to look after too. So thank you for everything you do. And thank you for the people who did come out tonight to our meetings. All right. Thank you everyone for being out, coming out again. And um, we are in the budget process and I know it's gonna be We've already had some long days and we're going to have some more long nights. But uh, anyway, I know we're getting close and Robin West quits taking my phone call. So we're not there yet. So uh, <laughs> we're working on that. But anyway, with that, um, appreciate you being here and uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion to have a second. Second. All in favor. We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.